Welcome to our Sunday evening service at Calvary Evangelical Church. My name is Jerome and I'm a member here at the church. Here at Calvary, we seek to be a Christ-centered church, a God-honoring church, and a Bible-loving and Bible-based church. We're an independent evangelical church based in Brighton, Sussex. Now, if this is the first time that you've uh, come across our online services or sermons, it's great that you're here. And it's my hope that you would be spiritually helped, that you'd be encouraged, that you would be built up, and even challenged. You can listen to our other sermons on our Calvary Church YouTube channel, um, where our pastor Philip Wells is going through a series in Hebrews in the morning. We've been meeting in the mornings for some time now, and this has been a time of great um, encouragement, and uh, it's lovely to see people face to face, and it's lovely to worship God in person. But we do understand that there are some among us who um, are still feeling cautious and even anxious about coming to meetings. Um, so, so we're live streaming in the morning because we want to make sure everyone benefits. We're not yet meeting on Sunday evenings, but we want to maintain the practice of worshipping tr- twice on a Lord's Day as much as we can in these, uh, in these times. So please contact the church or if you want to attend a morning meeting or find out more about who we are, look on our website or give us a call. Now it's our usual practice to preach through a Bible book and we're currently doing a series preaching through an Old Testament book, Esther. And we'll be looking at chapter three this evening. But before we look at tonight's text, let's still our minds and our hearts and let's, let's focus on the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted head above all. Father, we come before you with thanks and we praise you for your glorious name. We proclaim this truth, yet we pray that your kingdom would come in our nation, in our churches, and in our hearts. Please, Father, in these troubled and difficult times, show us your mercy, show us your grace. Please remember your people. We are weak and we are needy, and we we desperately need you. We pray that churches would be able to fully open that your people will be able to worship you fully in spirit and in truth. And we pray, Lord, that this virus um, that's caused so much destruction and pain and misery would be stopped from spreading further, that infections would reduce, that any new variants would not take hold and hinder any progress in opening up. Lord, we do pray for wisdom for our government and for our leaders as they consider the next phase of opening in the months and days to come. Lord, I pray that your people will be comforted, strengthened and built up. And I pray, Lord, that gospel work would not be hindered. Father, we do particularly think of those among us or those generally who are really struggling at this time and feeling anxious and maybe feeling isolated and not able to get out of the home as much or to be among people as much and have very real fears because of all that has happened, Lord. We pray that you would draw close to them and help them in their need. We do pray, Lord, that these times would lead to greater growth for your kingdom and we pray earnestly, Father, for an awakening. Father, there are so many so-called saviours vying for our attention. Lord, we pray that you would hold back the advancement of uh, ideologies and views or religions or false religions that bring spiritual deadness and confusion and don't bring life and peace. Please keep us close, Lord, to the only one that can bring peace and fullness and joy 
eternal joy. Keep us in communion with that one, our Saviour, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would bless this time with your presence and your prompting through your precious spirit. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing our first hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of Designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage take the clouds you so much dread. Are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust Him for His grace. Behind the frowning providence, He hides the smiling his purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet it will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. Our scripture reading this evening is from Esther, the book of Esther in the Old Testament, and we'll be looking at chapter 3. Um, I just want to mention, I'll be reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version, and you may notice that um, um, I'll be saying King Ahasuerus, and some, some of you may have other versions that speak of King Xerxes. It's exactly the same king. They're not different characters. It's just different names, so just to let you know. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So. As they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to, to, to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. 
In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the documents was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Here ends the reading of God's sober word. Let's now pray for the preaching of the word. Father, your word is a lamp to our feet. It brings illumination to our understanding and our minds. It brings comfort to our troubled souls. Oh Lord, it brings warmth and vitality where there's coldness and lifelessness. Please, Lord, may you bless the preaching of this word with your presence and with your leading and with your overruling spirit. May our hearts, may our minds, and may our wills be changed into greater Christ-likeness, Lord, and greater devotion to you as our great God and Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, several years have passed now since young virgins were first sought and gathered in the harem at the citadel of Susa in the Persian Empire. One such young virgin virgin was a Jewish girl called Esther, probably without any choice in the matter or any say in the matter. This young Jewish virgin experienced an unimaginable change where she found favor with the most important and powerful man in the known world at that time, King Ahasuerus. She was made queen of the Persian Empire in the place of Vashti, as we learned last week. And we also learned last week of how Mordecai, her closest relative, her father figure, discovers a plot to assassinate the king and he shows great diligence and loyalty towards the king, and he shows a commitment to justice and uprightness in ensuring that that plan is foiled and that Queen Esther is told. Now, although in this book, the name of the Lord, it's not mentioned once, 
we see his fingerprints all over the book. We see his fingerprints in the character of his people and how his hand sovereignly guides and ordains and superintends all that comes to pass in this book. God's providence is something that we should be very mindful of as the overarching theme as we study this book and we consider God's sometimes mysterious and unfathomable ways of working in time and history. Now, as we come to this evening's passage in chapter three, I want us to consider it under three thoughts. A resolute stand, an evil plan, and a deadly edict. So my first point, a resolute stand. From the offset, we can't help but to be puzzled by God's providence. Chapter three starts with after these things, and we cast our minds back to the honorable and the righteous acts of Mordecai at the end of chapter two. Yet in chapter three, we learn of this new character, this new character on the scene, this Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, who's promoted to the position of prime minister of Persia. Now the king advances him and he sets him above all the officials who were with him. This Haman is given a place of special preeminence and prominence and honor. Now it's surprising that we don't hear of the promotion of Mordecai. And my natural instinct was to uh, think, well, this, this just isn't fair. Shouldn't Mordecai be richly rewarded for his loyalty, for his vigilance? Mordecai's life-saving act is recorded in the book of the Chronicles and, and is remembered, yet in God's providence at this time, it's consigned to the dusty shelf and Mordecai is passed over He's unnoticed, he's forgotten. He remains in the humble position, the position of little significance. And in God's sovereign will, he's not honored and he's not exalted at this time. As we read about Haman in these early verses, we sense something ominous, we sense something foreboding, there's something brewing. Already we sense something that's ungodly in this man. Now was Ray Haman's rise to power due to his political expertise? Was it due to his administrative skills? Was it due to his gifts? Was it due to his qualities or his diplomacy? Well, we don't know. We don't know, but Haman was made great in a worldly sense. Prominence, power, ambition, and pride, craftiness, and wealth are all characteristics that we see in this chapter. They're all characteristics of Haman, and they're all characteristics which the world values. Now, it's likely that Haman used flattery, manipulation, strategizing, scheming um, to get to the position that he got to. And we're confronted with a contrast. Here we see a contrast between Mordecai and we see a Haman. And one commentator says the Bible is making us see how God changes the arithmetic by which we evaluate the relative importance of people and things. The world values prominence, power, position, seeking preeminence, while God's people are to be humble, lowly, not seeking exaltation, not seeking recognition in this world. Verse two says that all the king's servants who were in the king's, at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman for the king had so commanded concerning him. All were bowing down and all were honoring Haman except 
one. There was one who took a stand, showing the courage of his convictions. There was one who took the minority position. Mordecai refused to bow, but one can't help wondering, why? He shows a similar courage, a similar conviction, a similar sensitivity to a godly conscience as Daniel and his friends. But it's not as clear in the book of Esther, in this text, why Haman took a stand. Why in this matter did he choose to disobey the king's command? Was Mordecai feeling bitterness and jealousy towards Haman? Was he begrudging Haman because of his promotion and advancement to power? Some suggest he was being obstinate and arrogant by not bowing down. Well, I don't think so. I don't think there's anything in the text to suggest that. Was Mordecai not wanting to give worship or bow down before a mere man? Isn't that level of reverence and worship due to God alone? Was Mordecai concerned to be breaking the first and second commandments, making Haman a god? I think this is closer to it, certainly, and I think there's something in that. But the problem, the problem with this view is that Haman most likely would have had to have bowed down before to Ahasuerus and to Esther as, their, as, as king and queen. And we don't hear any concern about this. And actually, if you, if you look, look at chapter 8, we read of Esther falling to the king's feet and rising up again as his golden scepter is held out. And nothing said of this. The commentators I read, old and new, were unified in their view that Mordecai and Haman's ancestry may have had something to do with this. They suggest that the reason may be in the text itself. Now, Mordecai's identity as a Jew was certainly important and part of this. You see, after much questioning by the king's servants, he told them he was a Jew. He's disclosing his identity, the thing that previously he had told Esther not to do. The text also implies the true nature of the conflict in Haman's identity and in Haman's full name. Notice he's called Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha. Mordecai may have refused to bow down because Haman was an Agagite who was a descendant of Agag. Agag was a name for the kings of the Amalekites. Now who were they? These were nomadic people who in the wilderness were the archetypal enemies of the Jews. They were some of the earliest enemies of the Jews, of the people of God as they came out of Egypt, as, as they came through the Red Sea. They attacked Israel unprovoked and they would prey upon the weak. They would prey upon the vulnerable. They would prey upon those that were lagging behind in the wilderness. And some of you may recall that epic battle in Exodus 17 where Moses, he's up on the mountain and he's holding the rod while Joshua and his men, they're fighting in the valley, the Amal Amalekites in the valley. And, and, and the chapter closes with a declaration that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. We read in 1 Samuel 15 how King Saul devoted the Amalekites to destruction but spared King Agag and the sheep and the oxen in disobedience to what the Lord had clearly commanded and instructed. Later the prophet Samuel killed Agag with the sword. It literally says he hacked, hacked Agag to pieces. Now, Mordecai was a descendant of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, as was King Saul. So this enmity, it's rooted in an age-old conflict going back generations. But more than a historic hatred between nations, between peoples, this points to a far deeper and more profound conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. 
We can go back even further to the beginning and that conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. But why did Mordecai take a stand now? Why did he take it here and now? One commentator wonders whether this was the right issue for making a stand. Didn't Mordecai make other compromises with enemies of God's people? He had no issue with Esther going into the king's harem and told Esther to hide that she was a Jew in chapter 2, verse 10. Up until now, he hasn't been like a Daniel. It would appear that Mordecai has quietly obeyed the laws. He's assimilated into Persian life and, according to some, may have compromised, rather staying quiet about his people and his God. Well, I think what we're seeing here in Mordecai is the, the awakening of his conscience and a realisation that he has to draw a line in the sand. Now, some have suggested that his convictions came late. Well, I think we need to be careful not to read too much in the text. It doesn't say that. But what is certain, what is certain is bowing to Haman is something that is too much for him to compromise on. And people of God, is that not true of us? Some of us are like Daniels. Some of us are in situations where we have to take that stand very early very clearly um, and very, very strongly. There are some, there are some of us who are probably closer to a Mordecai. We're assimilated and, and, and we're trying to be faithful, but we're needing to choose our battles. Now, the Christian life is not a life that's built on negatives. Our Christian life is not built upon what we don't do. However, there are times when we have to take a stand. We think of the apostles in the book of Acts against the forces of Jewish and Roman power. You, you think of church history. Many took a stand for the advancement of the gospel. You think of the prophets. You think of, the, think of our Lord himself. You think of the reformers like Luther up against the Roman Catholic authorities at the Diet of Worms where he said, here I stand, I can do no other. Think of the Puritans ejected from the established church and forced out of their positions because they took a stand on gospel principles. The Christian life involves at some point taking a stand. Are we ever taking a stand? It's a good question to ask. And it will be different for different people in their circumstances, in their situations. It may be a family member blaspheming Christ's name and you have to say something. It may be in the workplace, you may be expected to participate in things that go against your conscience. It may be that your children are being taught things at school that go against God's word or not in line with God's word and, and you need to discuss this and you need to let people know that you're a Christian and this is how you're raising your children and how you conduct family life. We all ultimately have to take a stand on the gospel at some point. Now we do so with wisdom, we do so with gentleness, and we do so with discernment. You notice that Mordecai, he shows great resolve as he's asked day after day and he stands firm. He stands out and he stands alone. It can be a lonely and unpopular thing to do. Now it couldn't have been easy for him to stand up against the king's command and the most powerful man in the empire, second to the king. This led to severe consequences as we'll see in the next point. So my second point, an evil plan. We see in verse 5 that Haman was filled with rage. And humanly speaking, this is the response one would expect from a petty, egocentric and proud man. His pride is wounded and he wants to exact revenge. One would think it would be enough for him to seek the destruction of Mordecai. But as an old commentator, Thomas McCree, puts it, nothing less 
can assuage his anger than the destruction of the whole people. Revenge is insatiable. Verse 6 says, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. We cannot help but to compare Haman to those biblical antichrist type figures. You think of Pharaoh, you think of Antiochus Epiphanes, who's prophesied in the book of Daniel. You think of King Herod, the time of Christ. All had a hatred for God's people. We then think of those in history, such as Nero, Hitler, Stalin, those who engineered the most evil and brutal persecutions. But people of God, we would do well to, to kind of peel back the curtain to peel back and look behind the veil and understand the true nature is the spiritual warfare that is taking place here. Ever since Genesis 3.15, Satan has understood that the promised deliverer would come through the seed of the woman and through the people of Israel, the Jews. And we need to look beyond the instruments that are used and see the real arch enemy of the people of God. The real arch enemy is Satan. This is not merely a personal matter or the rantings of an egomaniacal despot. If nothing else, we learn here that as the people of God, we will have enemies and we have one arch enemy who is seeking the destruction of the church. Jesus said, we will be hated for his name's sake. As Christians, we have the benefit of knowing the full story. And although we have an enemy who is like a roaring lion and is roaming our enemy, he's on a chain. He is bound. He's under the sovereign control of God. Now, that's hard for us to understand sometimes, but it's true. He's a defeated foe. Haman, he's not only an egotistic and proud man, but he's a superstitious man who seeks to rely on chance or some kind of pagan means to help him execute his evil plan. Now, he's probably reflecting the superstitious pagan practices of pagan cult, uh, Persian culture at that time. In verse 7, we read, In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, uh, that, that is Lot, before Haman, day after day, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Again here, we see the wonderful providence of God at work, even over the casting of Lot's. It's not chance. It's not a pagan deity or divination that governs all things but it's the sovereign hand of Yahweh, the living God. Haman's a slave to superstition. As one commentator states, Haman's superstition is superintended and bounded by the decree of God. The month of Nisan is the first month of the Jewish religious calendar, which began with the Passover. So just as the Jews, they're preparing to celebrate that great deliverance from Egypt, Haman is planning their destruction. You notice this small detail, till the 12th month. God allowed for a 12-month delay, which provided a kind of buffer of time in the middle of the plot, enabling Esther and Mordecai and the Jewish people time. This allowed time for God's rescue plan to unfold and another great deliverance for God's people. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast in the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Haman now seeks counsel with the king to persuade him of his plan. It's shocking how little persuasion the king needs and how little curiosity or exercising of his critical faculties there is. He, he shows so little uh, in-depth thought or curiosity. He doesn't question or seek to investigate. Now, Haman, he's clever. 
he seeks to present a number of truths, half-truths and lies. In verse 8, he says their laws are different from those of every other people and they do not keep the king's laws. So it's not to the king's prophet to tolerate them. He then requests their destruction. So Haman is willing to lie, to bribe, to manipulate and play upon the king's pride, his arrogance and his self-interest. He's portraying the Jews as a traitorous and lawless people. Now cast your mind back to Mordecai's conduct. He's demonstrated that he's a loyal and law-abiding citizen. And the Jewish people would have been law-abiding and orderly citizens. Can this charge be made against us as Christians? The Jews were accused of not being assimilated. Now we have in some sense different laws as Christians, don't we? We have different moral laws, spiritually. We have a different moral code and a different view of what it means to be human. And as we, uh, as we, as we see our culture looking upon us as a church and what we stand for, often you'll hear things like, we're not moving with the times, we're archaic, we're irrelevant, we're on the wrong side of history. They want us to bow down to the prevailing culture. Now we should, as Christians, be law-abiding citizens, seeking to serve our city and seeking the peace of our city and nation. Haman offers a financial incentive of 10,000 talents, which is a huge amount of money. He's willing to bribe and pretends to guard against the king suffering a loss in his treasury. Now, the treasury may have been low in funds due to the remission in taxes previously granted by the king. It may be low in funds due to military incursions into Greece. We don't really know, but we do see a disturbing aspect of the king's response in that, again, he's simplistic, he's lazy in his agreement with Haman. There's almost a passivity about the king. He allows himself to be won over by such weak arguments. The king then says, the people are given to Haman to do with them as it seems good to you. So he arrogantly believes he is sovereign over the people, not realizing that the people belong to God and they're not his to give. As we're appalled by the king's lack of character and response, we must remember the king's heart is a stream of water in the hands of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And that's a good thing for us to remember when we get overly anxious about the actions and responses of our political leaders today. But we see here persecution for the people of God is a reality. It was then and it is today. Now here in the West, we as Christians, we're just beginning to experience a falling out of favor. We're beginning to see that Christianity is no longer the majority position. There's great superstition within the media um, towards Christianity, particularly conservative evangelical Christianity. But for many in parts of the world, this has long been the case, and they have faced far more severe and life-threatening persecution. There are Christians suffering and dying in parts of the world today for their faith. You think of places like North Korea, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Nigeria, Pakistan. But if we, just for a moment, bring it closer to our context here, here in Brighton, here in the UK, we can see parallels between Haman and King Ahasuerus and forces in our society today. There are Haman-type forces that want to see the destruction of the church. And this can often be organized groups seeking alliance with the government and government support and endorsement to enact laws that limit, that mute, that hinder, that control the church. I think we're going to see more of this. It's not likely that they would want us killed. Oh, no, no, this, this, is, this is far more subtle. There's a more subtle persecution which seeks to not kill us, 
but to certainly kill our message. We need to be careful not to focus on certain groups or organisations or worldviews and just kind of obsess about that. It's important that during these times, we understand the times, we understand the strategies, strategies used by our enemy, we understand the wiles of Satan, but we, we need to see the, the nature, the true nature of this warfare as spiritual, so we can use spiritual means to fight. Well, we see the deadliness and the intensity of evil in verses 12 to 15 as this deadly edict is enacted. And le this leads to my third, third point, a deadly edict. Look how comprehensive, expansive and encompassing this edict is. As the text says, then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. We can't imagine the fear and the terror the Jews must have faced at this time. Now in this section we learn how the providence of God sometimes comes with the most extreme and pressured circumstances. God doesn't always keep his people from experiences that take, take them to the utter extremities. And these passages describe for us how dark the world can be and how belonging to God's people can make one a target for the most virulent and potent persecution and hatred. The letter gives instruction to destroy, to kill and to annihilate all Jews young and old, women and children, in one day on the 13th day of the month, 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Again, notice the comprehensive scope of this destruction, humanly speaking. It would appear that the Jews are utterly doomed. They're like sheep to the slaughter, and the brewing storm is becoming a deadly catastrophe. Here we see the insatiable rage of the enemies of God's people, which comes up time and again through the redemptive plan of God. The book of Revelation describes this antichrist spirit in the great mystical Babylon, the mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations, drunk with the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus. During times when it looked like, looks like things couldn't get any worse for God's people, knowledge of his providence alone is not enough to sustain and uphold them. Certainly, we do need to submit to God's providence. That's hugely important. But, but we need to draw on his precious promises. We need his presence to carry us through the trial. We need to draw strength from his promises and be upheld by the presence of his spirit, being carried along. Isaiah 43 says, but thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. You are mine, when you pass through the waters I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Hebrews 13.5, um, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. In the chaos, in the difficulties, in the storms of our life, our God in heaven is in control, and he's close by, and he carries us through. A kind of contrast is set forth in verse 15 in that the city of Susa was thrown into confusion while the king and Haman, they sat down to drink. So on one hand, we have a picture of febrile, frenzied and fear-driven confusion. And on the other hand, we have a picture of two men at ease, at peace, 
sitting down. One commentator speaks of the contrast between the pleasure of the king and Haman and the perplexity of the city. The citizens of the city being in confusion indicates that there were those among the non-Jewish populace who sympathized with the Jewish plight. Now it's as if the king and Haman, they're sitting down to drink with self-congratulatory conceit. They're celebrating the day of doom for the Jews, showing such little sympathy. Little did Haman know that in God's secret providential purposes that this will make the mark the day of his destruction. And people of God, we, we see in these passages an important biblical principle. The believer is almost always brought low before they are raised up. It, it's a biblical pattern of the valley before the hilltop. It's the cross before the crown. I thought of that old Reformation slogan, after darkness there is light. In the darkness there is a bright and hopeful future for Christians because we know the end of the story, but we're not in glory yet. Is this not the pattern Christ has set forth in his humiliation and death? And then in his resurrection, his exaltation and his session at the right hand of the Father. Romans 8, 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So as we read this, this chapter and this book, let us remember that Christ is our great victor and conquering king not the Hamans of this world. This document of death was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples. We proclaim the message of life that is to go forth to all peoples and has, has done for the past 2,000 years and will do until the end of time. Church, do not be dismayed or discouraged during these times. It may feel that Satan and the Hamans of this world have the upper hand, but the gospel is prevailing and going forth And one day, all will bow the knee to Christ. And unlike this city of Susa and this present city of this world where there is confusion, there'll be peace and freedom from fear and the battle will be brought to a final end. And all our tears will be wiped away and God will dwell with us in that holy city, the new heavenly Jerusalem, forevermore. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this, your word that we have heard this evening. And we do pray, Lord, that you would apply this word to our hearts and that we would go away strengthened built up knowing that you are the God who providentially rules, superintends and governs over all things. But you are not a distant God. You're not aloof governing from a distant. You are a very present help in trouble, Lord. And we thank you so much for your glorious and wonderful promises that all believers, all those who are in Christ Jesus, can draw upon and feed on and know the riches of. Lord, please bless us with a greater awareness of these glorious promises. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our closing hymn is Psalm 46.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.